We are often surprised that our world is full of stories. Operas, TV shows, musicals, superheroes, gossip, everything. But the truth is, we can only think in stories. There's no other way. We can only speak to each other in stories. There is no other way. brain is a neuron computer that evolved to help us get by in the world, to tell us what is dangerous out there or what is desirable to us. In other words, it evolved to do predictions. And a prediction is a story. Something will do something. And actually, Everything we say is also a story. The only human language universal, that is the only bit of grammar that exists in every language, despite all this crazy variation of languages, is that there are nouns and there are verbs. In other words, something is doing something. So we can only think in stories and we can only speak in stories. So in this 9 a.m. segment of the crazy 24-hour birthday lecture, we were discussing this, the origin of storytelling, the origin stories origins, and all the way to a recipe for a perfect superhero story. Okay, so this is something that I'm really excited about. Uh, we think in stories. So clearly we can't think not in stories. If our brain is about, a bit of our brain, which is not about running our bodies, is about predicting the world, running a predictive model about the world, then having that predictive model in which we have somebody do something is the useful mm -hmm. way. If I say, then she kissed him back. Their twins smiled. Yeah, so, then she kissed him back. Their twins smiled. Eight words. And with eight words, I just I didn't really tell you a story. You made up a story in your head, a story of four people. And chances are that the story you made up has a fully connected graph. Yeah, so one possible explanation here is that well, there's always a she and a him and they have twins. So they're the parents. Then she kissed him back, he was, trying to kiss her and only for after a while she kissed him back. But why? They already have twins, so maybe he was in the wrong. She forgave. So we have some complexity about their relationship. We have, we understand they are the mother and the father of the twins who are related to each other. And we also understand that the twins were a little tense about the parents fighting, so they smiled. You know, when I tell this version, human listeners like all of us, all of you are, will come up in instantly with a version of the story. Sometimes a little bit different, but with eight words, we instantly create a really complex story that we project onto it. Our minds are having these stories. And why do we have these stories? Because we think in stories, yeah? Our, story, our minds create these predictive models about others. Someone or something does something so a noun and a verb together, and Krista, this is a question to you if this is correct. These are the only two, only language universals, correct? You mean the type of words? Um, yeah, that we have nouns and verbs. So every language has a noun and a verb. I think so, yeah. Yeah. So, so obviously, that is already a story 
a, a story. Yeah? So we are telling, in our sentences, we are telling stories. Because we have something or somebody doing something. We are humans, so we often say something or somebody has an intention, hence is doing something. We have these basic structures. So whether we are spoken or not, whether it's a sign language or a spoken language or a musical language, there's going to be have these elements in it. We think in a story. And I think we think in a story because this is how we evolved to think because we need to have predictive models out there in which things are doing something. Thinking prediction, and which will have to have somebody doing something, is a basic unit. And hence, cognitively, we cannot think anything else but, of, but stories. And we read about the world in stories, yeah? So we read stories, who did what, yeah? Uh, the television, the newspaper, the internet media, they are all selling us stories. Everything is a story. And not only in the sense that they are coming to us in a language that is using the noun verb story fundamental elements, but also in the sense that they are going to have some kind of personal story, who did what story that grabs us, yeah? Even when it's a piece of a data point, we hear it through stories of people. Yeah? If, if you want to tell the story of science, we better tell the story of people in science and their intentions <coughs> and the betrayal against each other. Yeah? And they are, aha, and we're going to suddenly uh, uh, listen. So listen to this theater, critique, friend, word, time, money, knife, blood, death. So we just told the story and all of these were nouns and your brain just filled those nouns with a really complicated uh, story but all the extra bits were the verbs. So it became that complicated story of betrayal via the verbs that your brain automatically added to these. So let me say it with a tiny little bit of change. Friend, word, time, money, knife, blood, death, theater, critic. I was trying not, not, to, not to do the intonations. <laughs> Maybe I did a little bit. Completely different story. One is a story of a betrayal. The other one is a stage performance about which a critic writes a piece. Yeah? Completely different. The, the, the two are to, to each other. I just changed it a little bit. And again, the, the difference was the verbs that you added. The story was different because of the verbs you added uh, were different. Okay, let's, let's, let's try it a little bit differently. I'm not going to put it up now, you just need to listen. Meet, greet, invite, cook, hug, kiss, wink, moan, conceive, embrace, grow, push, push, cry, Smile. So what happened here? I see several of you smiling. So this was a love story that ended up with a baby. Love uh, or life? Huh? Love or life? Yeah, exactly. Now let me change it a little bit. Yeah. Now, try not to look at what's on the screen because I'd like you to pay attention to the altered version. Meet, greet, invite, cook, hug, kiss, wink, moan, conceive, embrace, grow, push, push, bury, cry. 
That's the whole lifetime story. I changed smile to berry and the word of the little bit. The Made it much more emotional. The story changed because of the nouns around them are changing. So, and of course, maybe it's emotional because also, you know, I, I opened up another channel to you because I couldn't read this and not be emotional. So, but, but also <laughs> the, the point is clear, yeah? The point is there that, that we create these stories, we think in stories and, and instantly project the stories on, on everything. And in this sense, mathematics is a story, yeah? So Pythagoras is original picture story yeah, because a geometrical story is a story. We can read it as a story with, a, with nouns and verbs, yeah, that will end up as a story, yeah. Uh, Einstein's mass and energy cross-dressing equation, yeah, that's a story. And, you know, he had a problem writing it down mathematically. I mean, it was playing in him as probably a mix between mathematical and verbal story. And he needed help to turn it into the clean math that then re rewired physics. So I think, at least I think of all my maths as stories. And, and I think many, I don't know Balaj or how we're here, but um, many mathematicians also uh, uh, think it like that. Although sometimes it has all kinds of abstractions. There's a really great book. I don't know whether you, you've seen it. Why is it? I'm not quite sure. Let me see. Aha! Here, lost, found it. Okay. Have you read this book? Lost in Maths. So, this is, I really recommend it. It's a really great Who's book. Who's the author? Who's the author? Sabina Hossenfelder. Ah, okay, yes. I know the book. I haven't read it. Yeah, it's a great book. And, and what it says is that sort of it's, it's a really great exposition of the following simple point. Beauty of mathematics shouldn't really be a factor in deciding whether the world, whether the model is the better or worse description of the physical world. Because our primate brains, whatever we think of primate brains as a good story, Ill, whether it even is a mathematically mathematical language story will not be important will not be a good guidance whether the universe is built like that and right now when a lot of physics has run out of space for for more uh, experiments the beauty is a is a clear point so that anyway so this is a great 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 book um, about how we run into a limit of thinking about about the world because the science itself is a story, yeah? So the apple falls pulled down by gravitation, a story, mm -hmm. yeah? Oxygen bonds with hydrogens and makes water, as if there was an intention there. What? Biology gave spiders eight legs. <laughs> Humans evolved to be religious, yeah? All of these are stories. So we think clearly, I mean, we, if we think in, in stories, science is a story. And then we, we create a shared map of knowledge out there using our stories. Sometimes it's a real map, like in this clay tablet from Nippur, the first map. Sometimes it's a story of the, of the sky. The, the dots on Lascaux wall, the cave wall, are a map of particular bits of the sky. So somebody was, was telling stories with the, the night sky. Our description is, is not of all the different bits of the points there, like a computer would see it. We will tell a story of, a, in this case, a pre-Columbus 1491, and this is from 1507, when here you already have the Americas. This is the Europe, and this is the Americas. So we tell, we, 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 we have these, maps, but just like real maps, we are going to map the world for ourselves. And in that, it is not that surprising that we are going to assign agency to everything out there. Agency and intentions and actions with everything out there, including the stories that will end up in ourselves. So if you look at Michelangelo's 
propaganda job because when we stop admiring it, that's was really what it was. This is all a giant pile of, of stories in which people are doing all kinds of things to each other, but sort of ends up in the creation of all. So definitely a large part of the world had these kind of monotheistic religion oriented or uh, originated origin myth for ourselves, which had nothing to do with, with anything but a, a, an accumulated stories of thousands, maybe of tens of thousands of storytelling about where we come from. Until, of course, Charlie goes to Chile, especially the southern, southern bits of the Chile, and then has some observations. Here's a story that really, I thought not to be that happy go, maybe we should read. So this is, Darwin wrote uh, in Tierra del Fuego. They often suffer from famine. I heard Mr. Lowe, a sealing master, intimately acquainted with the natives of this country, give a curious account of the state of a party of a 150 natives on the west coast who were very thin and in great distress. A succession of gales prevented the women from getting shellfish on the rocks, and they could not go out in their canoes to catch seal. A small party of these men one morning set out and the other Indians explained to him that they were going a four days journey for food. On their return, Lo went to meet them and he found them excessively tired, each man carrying a great square piece of putrid whale's blubber with a hole in the middle through which they put their heads like the gauchos do through their ponchos or cloaks. As soon as the blubber was brought into a wigwam, an old man cut off thin slices and muttering over them, broiled them for a minute and distributed them to the famished party who during that time preserved a profound silence. Mr. Lowe believes that whenever a whale is cast on shore, the natives bury large pieces of it in the sand as a resource in time of famine. And a native boy whom he had on board once found a stock thus buried. The different tribes when at war are cannibals. From the concurrent but quite independent evidence of the boy taken by Mr. Lowe and Mr. Jemmy Button, it is, Jemmy Button was this, this guy that sort of captured the previous round, took, it, took him back to England and then brought him back here. It is certainly true that when pressed in winter by hunger, they kill and devour their old women before they kill their dogs. Their canoes to catch seal. A small party of these men are mourning one morning set out and the other Indians explained to him that they were going a four day journey for food. On their return, Lo went to meet them and he found them excessively tired. Oh, I've done this, somehow I jumped here, okay, here. Mr. Lo, when they did his answer, doggies catch otters, all the women know. This bo boy described the manner in which they are killed by being held over smoke and thus choked, he choked, he intimately intimated their screams as a joke and described the parts of their bodies which are considered best to eat. Horrid as such a death by the hands of their friends and relatives must be. The fears of the old women when hunger begins to press are more painful to think of. We were told that they then often run away into the mountains, but then they are pursued by the men and brought back to the slaughterhouse at their own firesides. So there's no independent corroboration of this story apart from Darwin writing it in his diary. I just thought it would be useful to have a little reminder for ourselves that our, our ideas about fireside storytelling, some kind of uh, always positive thing in the past in which we sort of idolize the uh, traditional cultures often runs very deeply against our own, own values. <sighs> okay, when we have our own self mythos, the scientific origin myth of ourselves, it's really difficult to have a real description that explains the genetic inheritance that we are we are having. So if we tell a story about a social behavior, 
let's say, storytelling to each other around the fireside. It is very difficult to pin down where it comes from genetically, because almost nothing, I mean, in fact, I think right now we think nothing that is a social behavior is really linked to a simple genetic underpinning. So we really need to understand not only the genes, the DNA level, but we need to understand how the DNA is expressed. So for that, we need to understand how, we need to tell stories of how it is being folded and then how that expression then turns into neurotransmitters that sometimes just go between two neurons, sometimes flood the brain. Then we need to tell the story of, of, of each individual neuron level behavior. We need to tell the story of the neural network. Each of these is at least one discipline, sometimes more than one, each layer. And then we get to the individual and only get, then we get to the society. So if you have a complex behavior, like if, if you have a, a story about the self-referential behavior, self-referential story about how we tell stories, for instance, or any other complex behavior, we're going to have a story that goes seven layers. And then we need to explain away a host of different stuff in our self-referential stories, all of which has a close connection of how we tell stories about ourselves with a lot of different origins of where the data points that we, we pick up in which we tell stories come from. Yeah, So I do that today in this in this 24 hour craziness that we bring data points for our self-referential origin myths, scientific origin myths from archaeology, from the DNA, from big data, from models, from experiments. And then we tell a story. And then maybe with that, we tell a story that is ever longer yeah? from our species having 6,000 years old, all the way down to maybe 800,000 years old. The po point is that our self-referential story will always be also a story and sort of an obvious point, but I think an important point that we tell ourselves. And with that, I'm going to tell you uh, some work with James about how to, how to do a superhero story. A few years ago, James, are you here? Maybe Sorry, me? Yeah, 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 you, you mate. Yeah, yeah, I'm here, or um, there'd be some Cartesian error if I wasn't. Um, yeah, definitely I'm here. <laughs> so a few years ago, James invited me to work with him on superheroes. And the claim was that every superhero has four characteristics. And the, the four characteristics, characteristics being that the superhero will have a superpower, will have some kind of minimally counterintuitive traits. So like we, for, to have a superpower, which means that you can do more than in reality, you need to have, you need to change reality, but that reality is changed only to the minimal extent. So it's the cheapest to calculate. These are all social norm enforcers. So we'll go out and punish those who are against the bad behavior of the society, something that hurts the society. And they are all, we always know the kin network or the social network they are coming from, even if they're orphans. So, so the claim was that you have these four elements and then you can build a superhero story. Our kids were a bit smaller then. And I thought, I'm gonna test this on them. It sounds good, but I want to know if it works. And a few years later, they prepared this amazing book because this became our story. So every evening they would say, can you tell us one of these stories? So we had a doggy whose name was Moji, Mojola in Hungarian. So I invented this thing, uh, turning Moji around this Jami. Moji was, as a, so the real dog was really uh, scared of cats. So it was afraid of strangers, dark, rain, cold. It was afraid of everything. So Jami the, was op the opposite of Moji. So Moji used to have these, this uh, re red uh, collar with white uh, polka dots in it. So Jami would wake up at, at night when um, the and when everybody was was um, asleep and would put on one of these badass collars with studs and go outside and fly up, take a big wings and fly up in the air. Uh, so this is. This is Jomi, and uh, 
This is Jami flying up in the air with the badass collar. These are the boys with, with the actual doggy. And then, and then the robber goes to the school library and teaching, steals the library books. And Johnny comes down on him. What did you do? And then we'll, we'll tell, tell the robot to put the, the books back on, not steal them from the kids, and buy ice cream from every child. So Jami becomes this superhero. And every evening, I would, it's, it's a whole book. Every evening, I would change it a little bit. So I would either violate one of these four rules or not violate one of these four rules. And I would always, it's always a little bit, some, I don't know, somebody steals the snow for the winter, they are the little uh, little dwarfs living on the other side of the, of the moon. There was some variations here yeah, every evening. And, and then what I wanted to know, I always ask the boys, okay, was this a good story or a bad story? Sometimes when I would violate one of the rules, they would insist that I tell another one. Of course, I knew that the second one cannot possibly violate any of the rules. So I can confirm that we can tell these stories. We can tell these superhero stories. Uh, and our children, well, at least my children, uh, were responding exactly, exactly to this point. So four elements, superhero, minimally continuity, continuity, counterintuitive, moral non-enforcer, and you need to know the key network, the family network uh, around them. And that's how you get to these things. And once you have this, you're going to end up with a superhero story. And the reason I'm bringing this here, apart from the fact that I can, <coughs> is, um, is it turns out that a lot of the a lot of the spiritual characters, the, the saintly characters, the divine characters that we make up also have these characteristics. So it turns out that, that every Catholic saint will have the same characteristics. Almost always the superpower is healing, but all the other bits will be known as well. And if you start thinking about stories we tell in all kinds of religious settings, you will end up having these four characteristics. And with that, we have a building block for telling supernatural stories that are out there. We violate a little bit only from the society. We tell a story that will make the listeners behave well towards, towards the, the, the current, current, towards the community. Uh, and, and we can then tell all kinds of supernatural narrative, supernatural stories about imaginary agents. Okay, now I'm a minute early compared to being a one hour late. Yeah, so can I jump in or, or who's, am I moderating this or something I think else? It, I, I messed up the who jump model, so jump in. Uh, um, yeah, just to kind of add a little bit to, to what Tamash said there on the superhero stuff. Um, so what we did there is we looked at um, what kind of cognitive processes respond to processing larger and larger groups, because of course, once you get beyond a certain size, that becomes really difficult to do. So the four characteristics that Tamash outlined there were our predicted responses to what would happen when you couldn't keep track of everybody in your group. So what you do is you end up kind of saying, okay, I can't keep track of the person who's going to steal my chicken, but there's some agent who can because they have these minimally counterintuitive traits that allow them to kind of see through the deceptions and you get these punitive figures who can be religious or comic book based. So we did that and the paper I did with Tamash in that first instance, we kind of did as we took 17 characters and we worked through them and we figured out, okay, do these stack up? And they did. And then subsequently we did a really big study, which is the biggest study I think that got done on this topic where we took um, what was it it was 70,000 comics and a couple of thousand comic book superheroes and we evaluated it numerically and we 
it came back that the prediction stacked up, which, you know, like never happens. And yeah, the, the, the idea was is that you have kind of growing secularization in the 20th century, but you still have the need for keeping track of these social groups, which typically you put in the supernatural realm. So what you have is this compromise, which is this fictional counterfactual realm where these quasi supernatural traits exist, but in a way that you don't have to believe them, but you can acknowledge them. So it's like a perfect compromise between the two, oh, like, you know, this rationalist approach, while at the same time honoring the, the, the cognitive power of supernatural representation. So it's just to say a little bit more. Anybody know a superhero, a divine character that lasted and violates these rules? So surviving, because of course the idea that, uh, it's the genius idea of James, that let's look at the evolutionary pressures on, on superheroes. There's so many of them, they must have evolved. And the human attention was the, the pressure on them. So then if you look at those that were successful and they survived, they must be showing characteristics of what kind of stories we like to tell. If you look around about the kind of turn of the 20th century, you had like stuff by guys like um, H.P. Lovecraft who wasn't minimally counterintuitive. He didn't give little alterations of the world. He did like massive alterations of the world. And I think there's one of the kind of, one of the kind of emphases in, in literature rather than perhaps popular culture is to kind of really shake it up a bit more and to violate the categories maximally. But, um, but that's kind of niche as well then too. And I'm not sure how, how much it survives. I don't know. I mean, that's my take on it, but I, I expect there's better examples than I'm able to offer. So Saints Lost. I've got a... I've got a wonderful example of in Satoma, um, in su southern uh, um, Estonia, a few weeks ago, there was a, a crossing of a river, which was really the, the border of Sato land. Satos are sort of a, a dialect of Estonia, living in the south of Estonia and, and a bit in Russia. And the border of, of Sato land uh, was a little stream. I mean, you can jump over, but there was a bridge. And next to the bridge, there were some stones. <clears throat> and they said these were St. John's st stones. And, and then we walked up there and they had on the trees were ribbons uh, tied up. There were flowers put there. So if you just saw it, it would be much more consistent to some kind of nature uh, worshipping, nature celebrating, uh, religious ritual, then to a Christian ritual, ritual where you would think St. John's, John might have been. And, and then it turns out that it was only a few hundred years ago, about 500 years ago, when the Russian Orthodox Church arrived in this area and where people were worshipping a nature and had a very deep and long tradition uh, of, of spirituality assigned to nature. So they, the Russian Orthodox Church then said, okay, this is, this, this was one of the revered points then. And they said, this is the place for St. John. So that from now on, we're gonna celebrate St. John here. They built a little chapel and then later a church celebrating St. John. So I, I wonder, so what happened here with St. John? Because uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm patchy around, around uh, Christian mythology, but, um, I know it's not called mythology, uh, but was he up here in Estonia? Yes, once he walked by and sat down on these stones and on these rocks, and hence he became, this is how it became saintly. So their, their attempt to endorse the, the original superhero stories with the arrival of St. John happened via the bum of Send John. The Human Bee series is about understanding who we are as a species so that we can equip ourselves to take responsibility for the planet. Because if we humans are not going to do that, there's nobody else who's going to save the biosphere. If you'd like to be part of this conversation, please subscribe here now.